Welcome back to Something Rotten, Season 3, Episode 3. Uh, Blake and I are moving forward. We are not looking up. We are not looking down. We are just moving forward into the world of Manhunt 2. Rockstar's follow-up to the notorious Manhunt that we decided was good question mark interesting pretty cool pretty cool game pretty cool um manhunt 2 came out four years after the original game uh it came out for the wii the ps2 and the psp as well as the pc uh and we've played the first half of it we got some stuff to talk about blake how you doing i'm doing great jacob and if you don't mind here at the top i'd like to commandeer the show and go ahead and jump into a bit of a history about Manhunt 2. Yeah, let's do it. In 1996, Chuck Palahniuk released his groundbreaking book, Fight Club. And in 1999, David Fincher, his, I believe, his second film after the equally groundbreaking Seven, put out a movie of the same name starring Edward Norton and Brad Pitt. And in, uh, I don't know, 2007, I think, Rockstar Games released Manhunt 2. And <laughs> Rockstar you know thought, wow, Fight Club was a good movie. Here's the thing. I like all those things equally, which is to say, not very much. <laughs> uh, Blake, I need to tell you something. When I was in college, I had three different Fight Club posters in my dorm room. Oh, in college. In college. I Because I bought one. That's too old. That's too old, Jacob. I would, oh, I no, I know. Believe me, I I say this with full full shame. I bought one, and then two different people were like, "Man, Jacob talks about Fight Club so much. I better just buy him a poster." Uh, and and every year, looking back, I uh, regret it more. It was it was you know my first year of college, but still. Can we terrible. dedicate two and a half to five minutes to Fight Club, just really quick? I have two things I want to say about it. <laughs> right off the bat, okay, yeah, let's do one it. to protect. To protect the names of the guilty, I will not be saying who this was, but there were people in my youth so in love with Fight Club that they uh, wanted to... Remember, they do the the chemical burns in Fight Club. Sure, yeah, the, the lie kiss. Kids I hung out with when we were younger as teenagers were so in love with Fight Club, they wanted to do the, the, the same. But instead of lie, what they would do is they would burn themselves with salt and an ice cube. You ever do that? No. If you put ice an ice cube on salt, it, there's like some chemical reaction. It will burn. And I had friends who would hold it there as long as possible. And it would leave like a small oh little scar. God. Not as bad as lie, of uh-huh. course. Um, so that was a thing that was happening. And then the second thing is Fight Club sucks can we just talk about this? i want and i <laughs> and you I know what of, it is i think i think the fight. movie's pretty good i've the book I, I, i've soured on chuck polanik as a whole the movie's still a fun watch. i like chuck, uh, chuck is it polanik or polanik i think it's polanik okay i like a lot of his books i like invisible monsters just fine choke is kind of good uh rant i think is good about the character who puts the boogers on his wall i like that book snuff all good <laughs> you are you are not naming my preferred chuck oh uh, i've novel. i think i've read the majority of his well probably not at this I point think he's the, put uh, out the a only lot. one that i consider that i actively like now is survivor oh uh, we should cut all of this out by the way this is a terrible start i just want to say that. i just want to say one thing about fight club though uh-huh both readings of it are bad if you have the wrong reading which is like dudes are cool fighting's cool Still a bad book, still a bad movie. I also think as a bit of a, a satire, it sucks. Yeah, it's hard to it's hard to really pin down the target of its like what what is what is its actual political message other yeah. than like buying stuff from IKEA is bad <laughs> dipshit. Which actually is not true. But buying from IKEA is good. They make cheap furniture. Yeah, that's, that's good. We on something rotten support IKEA. Um, let's talk <laughs> about why we're talking about Fight Club. Okay. Well, it's um, uh, it's apparent from the get-go that Rockstar, in a perhaps bout of creative bankruptcy, decided to just pull the uh, unreliable narrator card for this. Can I tell you, I had the thought, I mean, I wrote down, like, my second note is is just, like, okay, these two characters, you have the main character who you play as, uh, D- Daniel Lamb, referred to as Danny, and then... A little friend that he has named Leo Casper, who you actually do play as yeah. in like two levels, but 
you have these two characters and and it is just unbelievably obvious from the jump that Leo Casper does not really exist and it's just yeah. a voice in Danny's head. But I have had the thought what if it's not Fight Club and what if it's just the most lazily written character of all time? <laughs> what if what if they are actually supposed to be two different people? <laughs> no, because there is something it does and this is just like a small detail that I think's kind of clever is and maybe Fight Club does this as well. Actually, it's been many years since I've seen it, but very occasionally uh, Leo will disappear from cutscenes when another character mm-hmm. enters, but it's never like really pointed to. Like he might be on the periphery of a cutscene, and then you'll notice in the background of the same shot he's gone for a, for a few seconds. Or, or actually, there's another one where it was like he was in the cutscene, but the character was only talking to Danny and like didn't oh, even acknowledge sure. that there was another person there. Yeah. Um. Let's let's give let's give a little context for this so manhunt one uh was a game in which you are a man on death row who is broken out of death Mm -hmm. row and forced to participate in making a bunch of snuff films for this guy uh named the director and then eventually you killed him manhunt 2 starts uh, and you are a man in an asylum and uh there is a breakout happening in that asylum and you daniel lamb and your friend leo casper uh, breakout and there is a sinister organization called the project and they are chasing you and you go through a series of levels where sometimes danny wants to do something and sometimes the project are just chasing you and uh instead of the director's voice in your ear you have leo's voice in your ear the aspect of snuff is entirely dropped mm-hmm. um and that's that's basically it so far. It's weird because on the one hand, it is pushed beyond the grimy, bleak snuff aesthetic of Manhunt 1 into something much more aggressive and dark. It almost feels like a mud vein music video. Like it's just very uh, aggressively nasty. But on the flip side of it, it's also kind of like a pulpy 60s noir thriller. Like, this organization kind of feels like some, like, Doctor Strange love shit. Like, it's tonally very uh, all over the place in a dumb way. Yeah, so so let's I, uh, let's let's get this out of the way. Uh, Blake, how'd you like playing the first half of this game? I don't like it. I think this game's bad. I don't enjoy playing it. <laughs> I sent you and I the one time I have we have talked I have told you what I thought about the game before recording was when I messaged you and said, "Let's do a good game next season." <laughs> Cuz this yeah. sucks. It's it's a bummer completely. It, it there in in almost every way, playing it is easier than playing mm. Manhunt 1. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the only way that it's not easier is that it's uh, uninteresting. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like, it's easier to not die. It's incredibly short. Mm-hmm. Uh, the controls are better nominally. Um, but... With with all that smoothing out of all of the kind of mechanical things, uh, what has gone is any intrigue in playing the game, uh, really. There are still interesting things that we'll talk about, but, like, playing Manhunt, I felt like I was kind of discovering something mm-hmm. new and weird. And playing Manhunt 2, I just feel like I am playing a mean game from 2007 and when we talk about the history what happened with this game maybe the reception and how people feel about it a decade or so later um i think it's interesting to note that like manhunt for all its controversy there's still plenty of people back then and now being like yeah but this is a good game it's interesting to think about manhunt 2 has completely lost the part of the conversation where anyone is willing to talk about the game itself because it's like not in any way, it's not an interesting game. The only thing kind of fascinating about it is the controversy surrounding it. Hey, Blake, you know our podcast is better on Nebula, right? Oh, for sure. Everyone knows that. Early episodes every week, bonus episode for every miniseries, all the good stuff. Yeah, I just I just wanted to make sure that you knew. Yeah, I mean, I edit the show and I have a cal- Google Calendar. Like, I got it under control. Right. It's like I have I have like, you know, two and a half pages on the 
like on the history of the controversy and none of that none of that is makes the game cool yeah you know like I, there's so much more to say about the context surrounding it and and throughout my time playing it i was just thinking not worth it you know like mm-hmm. this whole this whole like cultural war over over ratings and manhunt 2 and like what's appropriate for children pick a better game to have that <laughs> war over because this one is just not the pick one to manhunt do. one Let's go back to that one. Uh, Jacob, tell me about the history of Manhunt 2. Well, do you want to talk about you want to talk about the development or you want to jump into the ESRB shit? Let's get into the development. Just a little background, because it is different than Manhunt 1. Yeah, okay. So, um, this game was uh originally developed by Rockstar Vienna, or at least they're the ones who started making it, uh, because Rockstar North, who uh, made the previous one, were making Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. Mm-hmm. Um, however, midway through development, uh, Rockstar Vienna closed mm-hmm. and uh, shut its doors. And so from there, Rockstar London took over with additional help from uh, Rockstar Toronto for the Wii version and Rockstar Leeds for the PlayStation Portable. Uh, However, uh, within that, uh, Vienna got left out in some (laughs) uh, notable ways. So in the case of Manhunt 2, uh, there were uh, 55 developers who worked on this game Mm -hmm. from Rockstar Vienna who were not credited in the final game. Um, You know, Rockstar was a big studio, but... 55 developers uh, still represents a lot of people who worked on a game who were not credited at all. And and the people there uh, certainly said a lot of what we did ended up in the final game. It's not like they scrapped it yeah. and started over when they moved from Vienna to London. Super common tactic by Rockstar, which sucks. Though I feel like you usually hear it about like, hey, I left the company of my own volition halfway through and they left me out of the credits. It sucks to just be like, well, you closed our studio and you right. left us out of the credits. Like, that's out of 55 people's control, you know, if you close a mm-hmm. fucking company, but or not a company, but a arm of the company. I do think that it's interesting. Uh, nowadays, a uh, four year development cycle is fairly typical. And, and certainly with Rockstar, we see much longer uh, development cycles. How many Grand Theft Autos did they make between? Manhunt 1 and Manhunt 2. 2? Well, two? no, 3. Well, yeah. uh this would have this came out the same year as uh Grand Theft Auto 4. So, between that would oh have been I, I, thinking about these two games next to each other of this game standing next to Grand Theft Auto 4. I'm trying to think. It would have been 2 or 3 cuz I don't know if Manhunt came out before Vice City or after, but San Andreas and 4 would have been developed at the same time um somewhat look up the timeline yourself listeners to figure that out um 20 years ago the the like process of pumping out sequels just happened much more rapidly mm-hmm. you i feel like you you less often did you have a game come out and then wait you know four to five years yeah. and then have another game game came out especially because these ones released essentially in the same console generation mm-hmm. You know, like, both of these games were on the PS2, even though this one was also on the Wii. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it is It is just kind of uh, interesting that it did not seem like they... Uh, they didn't finish Manhunt 1 and were immediately like, all right, get to work making another one of those. They kind of, kind of let it lie for a while. Well, I feel like maybe they were, and just the whole Vienna issue meant that it was... Kind of took a while to get out That's the door. That's true. That's a good, you know, it could have come out earlier if they didn't shut down. We're also studio. hitting an era of Rockstar, like, really ramping up its production quality, which, like, GTA 3 and GTA Vice City and those games, obviously, high production quality for the era. But, like, by the time you're hitting, like, GTA 4, you're seeing this huge, like, first major jump in Rockstar games. And I wonder if that also increased development time because GTA 4 also took a long fucking time after San Andreas that it did, that mm-hmm. San Andreas didn't take from Vice City. So I don't know. Yeah. It's, um, it's a weird one. The other weird thing that I will say, not specifically about the development of this game, but just about its, its existence, is that it is a Wii game. Mm-hmm. You know, and even though we're playing on PC, you can play it on PS2 or PSP. There are many things in this game that just scream, this was a game developed for the Wii. Yeah. Um, 
One of the maybe slightly less obvious is the way that aiming works, which has these, like, big arrows that will, like, instantly snap to enemy heads in a way that I can just picture, you know, doing with the Wii remote. Uh, the more obvious is that all the executions now have motion controls incorporated into them, where in order to stab someone with a syringe, you have to, with a Wii remote, you know, push the Wii remote up and down, making a stabbing motion, or bizarrely, playing on PC, you have to do the same motions with the mouse. I feel like I've never played a game that has emulated Wii motion controls with a mouse before. It feels terrible. I hate it. They mm -hmm. also put the, uh, the like, little icon for what motion you need to do in the left-hand corner of the screen, meaning you stop watching whatever is actually happening on the screen. A lot of animation hours I'm just ignoring now. Uh, I don't like it. I do like the snap-to-head aiming, though. I think that's kind of a fun little mechanic. Oh, it makes it, makes it easy. And, and, Blake, I'll tell you now, I made myself play the first half like this. You can turn those motion sensitive things off in the menu, oh, and really? I will certainly be doing it for the second half. Like uh. you can, you can turn off the interactables because the PS2 and PSP versions don't have that. Oh. They just, they just have the animations play out. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I'm gonna do that. So you still get all the crazy animations, right? Oh, uh, it's a little cheat code, um, huh? Yeah, but but I think you know maybe even more interestingly than their desire to work motion controls into this game is just the mere fact that it was released on the Wii. Mm -hmm. And as we'll talk about, a lot of the controversy of this game was not specifically about the content as much as it was about the content that is now present on the Wii gaming console. Yeah. You know, like that was that was the the source of the scare because the Wii was just viewed as so much more family friendly and so much more kind of like a young people's gaming console than something like the Xbox or the PlayStation. And it's a bit of a jump in logic to just assume a game on the Wii means young children will play it because like the ERSRB, like their, their rules establish that if a, a, 10 year old goes to a GameStop and brings up a copy of Manhunt. There's no visible guardian. I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's some mental gymnastics that happened. You're, you're right to think that, but I, I also think it speaks to how much more culturally ubiquitous the Wii was sure. as a brand than like any other gaming console previously, because yeah. I, I look, um, who knows, but I would guess that Hillary Clinton didn't have an image in her head of what kind of games should be released on the PlayStation 2. Yeah. And clearly, as we'll talk about, she did for the Wii, as did, you know, many other people. And so it's like this this weird mainstreaming of gaming where so many more people had a Wii and knew what a Wii was than any previous gaming console that suddenly there were these discussions had about like what the target audience mm -hmm. of it was that were never had about uh you know like specific consoles yeah. in the past let's just start talking about it because as we've said the game is boring um <laughs> but the the rating stuff is interesting mm -hmm. um so as you might remember manhunt one uh was a controversial game uh People did not like it. It was uh, falsely tied to a murder. Um, there were lots of lots of questions about w what this level of violence meant, and also lots of responses from from you know critics mm -hmm. saying this is a very violent game, but we like that it exists. Whatever, yeah. you know, it, it, it said in the same breath as Clockwork Orange or uh, Bad Boys Two or Fear Factor in Hell one yeah. specific instance. Um, when this game was originally uh, not released, but given to rating organizations, as happens before a game releases, um, in the ESRB rated it AO, and the British Board of Film Classification, which uh, this project has, has helped me learn a lot about uh, ratings, boards, and structures... <laughs> The British Board of Film Classification does not rate all games, only games that are perceived to be extra 
violent, extra sexual, extra controversial. Mm -hmm. Um, It uh, essentially rejected it completely. Um, they, They just said, like, they would not issue a certificate to Manhunt 2 at all to be sold mm-hmm. anywhere in the UK. Um, they said that that um, Manhunt 2 was impossible to modify to make it more appropriate. Uh, they said it was unremitting, it, it's unremitting bleakness and callousness of tone in an overall game context, which constantly encourages visceral killing with exceptionally little alleviation or distancing, uh, distinguished it from other games, and made it just not deserving of a release at all this is kind of an interesting passage here there is sustained and cumulative casual sadism in the ways in which these killings are committed and encouraged in the game which i think is both a uh lazy read and also kind of accurate read of what the violence is like in this game it's you know it 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 happens more than once that like previously with with manhunt one jack thompson said it was like a murder simulator and it's like you know he's not wrong Mm -hmm. necessarily like that is the description of what the game is it's just kind of whether you consider that uh grounds for not releasing it or not yeah um so so this happened both both in america and the uk and uh, a whole range of other countries, which we won't go into as well. Uh, Germany, Malaysia, New Zealand, South Korea, Australia. Um, this game was was denied classification. In America, uh, what an AO rating means is essentially no stores will sell it. Mm-hmm. Um, brick and mortar. So now... Brick and mortar. No brick and mortar stores. Yeah. So So now it's actually... Like in 2022, you could release... A, an AO game uh, and you could sell it on a digital storefront or sell it as a direct download or something but especially in 2007 when digital downloads of things were not nearly as common um, that yeah. basically was was a death knell for a game you know the only the only AO games that I knew of at the time were like the Playboy Mansion game or whatever oh I believe co-directed by Brenda Romero or produced by Brenda Romero <laughs> was it really? Yeah, that's that's a that's a real thing. Uh, let me fact check that. She was a designer on the game. Brenda Romero was a designer on. Maybe we should do that game. <laughs> As you might guess by the fact that uh, we are playing Manhunt Two, it was released. However, uh, the the road to release was not. It was not a simple back and forth. Um, so the game. Uh, there were several modifications made to Manhunt 2's content in order to get it re-rated by these various organizations. Uh, most notably, when you play the game, is when you execute someone on the PS2 or Wii version, though not necessarily on the PC version, um, when you execute someone, the entire screen gets this really harsh filter over it of static and reds and greens, uh, almost completely obscuring what's happening. It's it's like, it's a really... <laughs> I don't want to say a lazy solution, but it is a solution where they're clearly like, we couldn't rework the entire game. Yeah. And so what we're going to do is just obscure the executions completely. Um, and those are present in, you know, in basically every execution you do, where maybe you can still make out what's happening, mm-hmm. but you certainly can't see facial expressions. It's hard to see blood. It's hard to see, like, what's being done with specific weapons. Yeah, I I think, I think it, coming off of Manhunt 1, I don't like the choice of Manhunt 1 also had this. If it, was, if it was like, remember Kane and Lynch 2 censored its kills, and that was like an aesthetic choice. If you shot someone in the head with a shotgun, you wouldn't actually see it. I think, like, it could be a cool choice, but be, when you have the knowledge that it was done to get around, like, a shitty rating, it's like, ah, that's a bummer. Like, that doesn't work Yeah, for me. and, and as, we'll, as we'll talk about when we get into the, the content of the game, Manhunt 1's filters made sense mm-hmm. because they were part of a snuff film, Manhunt 2's filters are not contextualized in the same way, and so they do just seem put there mm, yeah. for the purpose of obscuring, which which is just kind of less interesting. Yeah. Um, 
in addition to those filters, uh, there were there were several differences made to the executions themselves. Um, there were apparently more decapitations possible in the game, and they removed most of those except for a couple that are story relevant, sure. which we actually we did see one of those. Um, they changed the the animations of the pliers, uh, which previously. Um, did some castrating yes, and sir. now uh do do less castrating um there this is an interesting one because these are also this is a difference between versions there are uh non enemy characters mm -hmm. in some levels there are just kind of random like homeless people or civilians like walking around um and you have the option of killing them or not but in the revised version uh, they took out these characters because I think some of the sadism was referencing you being able to do incredibly violent murders to people who were not enemies. Mm -hmm. um, so all of that was taken out. And another thing that was taken out, except not on the PC version, is there is no longer a scoring system in the game. So this this is, I think, a fairly a fairly crucial one because you'll remember in Manhunt 1... After you completed each level, you would get one to five stars, and that was dependent on how quickly you did the level, but also how violent your murders were and how close you did them to each other. And so that was one of the the arguments for the game incentivizing a real-life gruesome murders is because they gave you more stars for more violence. Um, and so... In the Wii, PS2, and PSP versions of Manhunt 2, there is no longer a rating system. Um, which, one of the producers of the game claims was actually... They just wanted to take it out for, for game flow reasons. But honestly, I just kind of don't buy that. I don't either. I, I think that, that, you know, they took it out because that was a specific thing brought up in the controversies. Yeah, if your game is accused of having casual sadism, it feels like a scoring system might be a big reason why. Yeah, so so after all this happened, the ESRB took another look at the game. Uh, they re-rated it M. They said, all right, this is this is an M game. And were people um, satisfied with that? Were they okay with well, that? Here, well, here, we'll, we'll get to that in <laughs> just a second. The British form of film classification uh, did not uh, j judge it acceptable. And what happened is this very long and, and uh, kind of ridiculous series of back and forths where... The British Board of Film Classification itself has an appealing board uh, that is called the Video Appeals Committee. And so the BBFC said it was still unacceptable. The Video Appeals Committee said this is an incorrect rating. You clearly kind of still have like a bee in your bonnet about this game and, and you are judging it more harshly than other games. Uh there were several back and forths, but ultimately the the appeals committee overruled um, the the original film classification, and it was allowed to be released a year after the U.S., uh, which is when it was released in other territories as well. And so it's it's like you can go on you know you can go on Wikipedia and read this, but it is this really bizarre sequence of events where these two regulatory bodies are like arguing back and forth about whether or not this is acceptable and reading between the lines it really seems like the bbfc did not want to like like just had a sticking point about this game they just they just really didn't want manhunt 2 to come out do you have any idea of whether or not the bbfc or vac or any of these other rating bodies that aren't the esrb actually play the games when doing this because the esrb famously does, like they don't play the games they're shown footage mm -hmm. of the games like do you know in other territories if that's the same i don't i would imagine it's the same however one of the really interesting things to come out of this controversy uh in the u.s but also abroad is that this was one of the first times when people were like hey you should be more transparent about why you're rating these things mm -hmm. the way that you do that that there were actually several you know politicians in the US 
in learning what the ESRB was and what it did were suddenly upset that they did not they couldn't see the whole process yeah. you know like they didn't know what exactly was making it an m or what exactly took it from an ao to m or what their reasoning was because the esrb is kind of a black box where mm -hmm. you you send something in and then a rating comes out and i would agree with that i think that i think that the mpaa all of them which are famously mm -hmm. uh very quiet about how they do their work i think they should be more upfront about it it seems like it affects the film industry more because an r seems to be harsher than an m these days in terms of like what will sell to a broader market right. but uh yeah i i agree with the politicians on this one yeah though it is interesting that i can't think of a game and maybe this just isn't made uh, maybe publishers or developers are quiet about this, but like, can you think of a recent game that seemed to be going for one rating, but then received another? Like they were like shooting for a T rating and got an M because I don't feel like that actually happens mm, very much anymore. Only two AO games after this, um, which was uh, Agony and Outlast 2. They had to walk there thing back because they got ao oh gosh yeah. I god agony what a what a bizarre game yeah um yeah so it's it's it is weird and it's also weird you know this kind of it does call in the question of it's the same thing with our movies where the spectrum of what can be in an m game or an r movie is just so vast mm -hmm. the idea that like halo 3 is rated m and also Manhunt is rated M when when those games are just like, you know, could not be more different in terms of the inappropriateness of the content that they're putting on display. Yeah, I've often like wished there was a more legitimized higher rating than M or R. You know, back in the 70s, like there was a push to legitimize the X or NC-17 rating and you got a lot mm -hmm. of movies that were very, you know, uh, Midnight Cowboy won Best Picture, you know? Like there was a real push right. to make that a thing and that would bridge the gap between R and Triple X. And video games have never really had an equivalent, but I think across the board in movies and games, like it would be beneficial to have a new rating that accounted for things that weren't you know halo 2 like manhunt 2 does not need to be like not sold at best buy or whatever but maybe it does need a stronger rating than just an m yeah or you know the the alternative because basically what it actually asks for is more attention paid by the people who were buying it because sure. the esrb i think is largely designed for parents mm -hmm. buying games for their kids and if you look at the little m rating it does say intense sequences of violence, gore, language, mm -hmm. whatever. But, uh, you know, like, Halo and Manhunt probably both have the language, yeah. uh, d like, thing written on them, and, and those two, again, could not be more different. So yep. it's, you know, like, I, I do sympathize with people who, like, I do sympathize with the ratings boards because I think they have a very challenging position, um, and it is it is instances like this that really push them to kind of their their breaking point that reveal some stuff about yep. about the system so uh going back going back to manhunt um the esrb rated the revised version of the game m however uh there were several worries that an ao game with a few tweaks was about to be publicly released uh, there was a a public letter written by Senators Clinton, Hillary Clinton, uh, mm -hmm. Bay, Brownback, and Lieberman, um, that was about basically this, where they said, um, one, it's bizarre that the ESRB has changed its rating when the British uh, equivalent has not. You know, they were looking at the British Board of Film Classification and thinking, hey, they still say it's AO. How does the ESRB say it's an M game? Um they say that uh, there should be more transparency, as mm -hmm. we talked about. They mm -hmm. want to know how the decisions are made. Uh, and they also say, and this is a thing that will come back up again, that because it's on Wii and people are using the motion controllers, that makes it a, a more viscerally violent experience. Sure. The fact that you are not simply pressing a button to stab, but you are miming a stabbing motion 
uh, makes it more violent, mm -hmm. which, again, I think is an interesting point. You know, I don't totally disagree, but we don't really have the the space to talk about that, you know? Sure. Yeah, I mean, like, well, you see it pop up in VR now. It's like, you know, first-person yes. games in VR, like Hitman VR. I love Hitman 3. I don't really want to play it in VR because I don't want to mime out those kills. And I'm someone who is not Hillary Clinton. So I can understand, mm -hmm. honestly, like, I can empathize with her concerns there. I think that's a realistic concern to not want a child, uh, granted, a, a child shouldn't be playing this game. That's beside the point, though. To, like, be mimicking the executions of Manhunt 2. I understand. Yeah, I mean, I have I have a, a, a good, uh, like, a friend and a, a very talented video maker colleague named Lam Hoot, who's done a lot of work and research on mm. violence in VR. And, and he has, he kind of has similar concerns in that, like, you know, you can fairly accurately learn how to actually reload and fire guns oh, in sure, vr sure. in a way that you absolutely cannot by like hitting the reload button i think you know the wii's motion controls are primitive enough that you are unable to yeah. really accurately recreate any motions you know the essentially you're just asked to swing your controller to the side or to the front or back and i think if that's all it takes then you know, kids already know how to stab. I don't think anyone <laughs> is learning how to stab from moving sure. the Wii motion controllers. But I don't want to totally discount that adding motion to an experience is in some ways adjusting the the experience of the game and how, how what's in the game affects you. So I, I think, you know, it's like, ultimately, I think Manhunt 2 should be allowed to come out you know playing yeah. it now it honestly doesn't seem it, it does not seem like it's a a you know more controversial game mm -hmm. or more violent or whatever in any meaningful way than other games that exist but you know i i don't want to just be the kind of like gamer brained like aha stupid politicians don't understand video games yeah. because even though i think that's true i i do think that that they are raising uh, questions that shouldn't be, like, completely written off. Um, one fun note about this saga with Hillary Clinton and Rockstar Games, who actually has quite a history of uh, coming after Rockstar Games. I believe she was also involved with uh, Hot Coffee and Manhunt 1. Anyway, uh, Rockstar poked a little fun at her in a GTA 4 released the next year in 2008. Uh, the face of the Statue of Liberty, called the Statue of Happ Happiness in Liberty City, is Hillary Clinton's face, effectively. <laughs> so there you go. It it sure is. I remember seeing that and thinking, they can do that? <laughs> they're, yeah. They're allowed yeah. to do that? I pulled up a picture of it just now, and I kind of thought the same thing. But maybe it was parody, satire, whatever got them free. And and one, well, actually, not even one more thing. But I do want to note that um the the parents of the child who was murdered in the case that was linked to manhunt uh did reemerge for this and say you know frankly that they were shocked that uh that rockstar was making another one of these yeah. um which you know again i don't think that murder was caused by manhunt but if i was those parents and i had been in this whole lawsuit i do think i would also be shocked if i suddenly learned that that video game studio was just making another one you know yeah um you want to talk about the game a little bit? I got some thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, let's talk about the game. The first level, I think it's pretty good, actually. It's cool. Yeah. I mean, it's effectively like a, a set piece. You know, there's just a lot going on. You're kind of getting the tone, the vibe. You're escaping an asylum, which like in 2007 terms means uh, people with mental health problems have turned into violence-loving lunatics. <laughs> of course. <laughs> but like it has a fun horror vibe. Um it uh, immediately shows that there's no way to look up or down in this game, though. Yeah, this game doesn't have a Y axis that you can control with the camera, and it's. I have a theory about this, but okay. I want you to tell me what you what you think about it. I don't know because I think old, old Rockstar games did this as well, like Grand Theft Auto Vice City. I remember not having a Y axis, but like. I don't know why it's in a game this late. I have not been able to figure it out. It's like, it's also, it almost feels like Doom 
you know, yeah, that yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. doom. You can't you can't aim up or down. Here is my theory about okay. it, and this does actually, even though I don't like this game, I do think that it it links in really interesting ways to previous games that we've okay. we've played on this because like. Kane and Lynch 2, there are real efforts to make the camera feel handheld here. Mm. Like, the camera mm. really sways back and forth, and when you run, there's a little of the, like, jostle of mm. someone holding a camera running behind you. And I think their reasoning is that they don't want the camera to go above you because it would require the unseen, like, cinematographer to suddenly be a crane. You know, like, I think they're really trying to keep the camera limited to what an actual person could film. That's yeah. that's my theory of that's it, that they're so attached to the aesthetic. But that's a weird choice, given that Manhunt 2's story is not focused on being filmed yeah. in any way. That it's not about uh, making a snuff film or, or even really being surveilled although i guess you could say danny is paranoid mm -hmm. um but it, it it's just you know so i think they're making an aesthetic choice here that they're extending to kind of limit your gameplay options uh, but i don't i don't think it pays off because i don't think they actually do enough with the idea of you being filmed yeah um one of the things that pops up from the jump i, I played this game and my partner was here when i started it and uh, immediately she was uh, kind of snickering at the game in a not great way because, man, the writing and humor in this game is that, that brand of rock star that just sucks. Like, it's really yeah. just, like, aggressively crass in ways that, like, look, I don't mind a good crass joke, but, like, old rock star was not funny. Like, their crassness was just stupid and juvenile. And this game is full of this shit in a way that Manhunt won did not seem to be yeah like in in the first seconds of the game if you don't successfully sneak past the cell there's like a prisoner who like pees on you or yeah. like throws his shit at you or whatever and it's just like ha ha that that happened kind of like that scene in silence of the lambs remember that it's not piss or shit yeah you but... know i guess manhunt 2 is actually exactly as good as silence of the lambs <laughs> i'd say so for sure it's about as good as fight club if you ask me um yeah, it's it, it's got it's got really, you know, it's got it got this kind of juvenile sense of humor. And what I will also say that differentiates it from the first one in a way that I find really unfortunate is there is no there's no ironic distance anymore. You know, like I I think what the director did so well in the first one is kind of like elevated the entire game to the point of satire yeah where you know even though we talked about how it was kind of absurd that the director's lines were like oh i'm gonna come when you like killed someone yeah. at least that was so silly that you were kind of like this none of this should be taken literally yeah you know that that this is it's just it's just a heightened world whereas in this when you kill someone the characters are just like, yeah, get some. Yeah. You know, they're kind of like, fuck you, in this way that is both boring, but also, like, feels like they're not saying anything with the murders in the same way that the first game was saying something. I, I think that's, yeah, that's an interesting point. I think this game feels, in some ways, less extreme than Manhunt 1, you know, uh, despite mm -hmm. the controversy and, like, the fact that several years passing means it's like has a higher graphical fidelity so like it, it can be more bloody but i actually think the murders in manhunt one were scarier or meaner to me because of the context of them and this it feels like if i pull out a gun in grand theft auto free roam mode and just like shoot a bunch of people it's meaningless it means nothing and it actually for all the controversy around this game I don't actually feel it's that extreme because it just feels like a little sandbox where I'm kind of blowing off steam in a way. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and and, and also there, I think this is is related to their idea of having motion controls control the executions. They're just so so silly, and this is almost contradicting what mm -hmm. I said about this game being less hyperbolized. But it's like in Manhunt, when you killed someone, you generally felt like that's 
I, I could see a murderer making that choice, you know, yeah. especially especially something like your character who was just kind of trying to get through, you know, it was like as horrible as it is. That's maybe how you would kill someone with a baseball bat in this. The executions are so drawn out because they want you to have these like multiple Wii motion yeah. prompts that they're just it's like it's like there's way more repeated punching and like you know multiple stabs and all of this stuff that just kind of doesn't it doesn't have the same weight it, it it's more it's more gratuitous mm-hmm. but it's it's less legitimate feeling maybe yeah i mean like narratively life was meaningless in manhunt one and that was a really good choice and mechanically death is meaningless in manhunt two I'm interrupting our show with a hot take, and I need everyone to buckle up for it. Paying people for work is good. Yell at me all you want. This is just my take. Correct as it may be. Jacob and I love making something run, but it is actual work to record and edit these shows. Not to mention playing some absolutely terrible games. You know the ones. Usually shows like this would have a Patreon or something, but we've actually got a way better deal. And that's with Nebula. Nebula is this service created and controlled by people who make smart, good things. You probably know it as a video service, and I know Jacob has put all sorts of exclusive videos up there, but it's also the host of the premium feed of Something Rotten, which is the special little podcast feed where every episode comes out a week earlier and even includes exclusive bonus episodes for every miniseries. Now you might be asking, that sounds great to me, Blake, but why were you talking about paying people for work? Well... Glad you asked. When you sign up to Nebula, which you can do by going to nebula.tv slash something rotten, that money doesn't go in the trash. It goes to the nearest place to the trash, which is the podcast Something Rotten. That's right. You can get yourself a premium feed and support the show at the same time. The show is better on Nebula, and you'll be a better person for signing up. And that's just the truth. Where, like, mm-hmm. there is... Abs- this. I don't know. If the writer was here, he might tell me about his grand statement for this game but it truly feels like a game with nothing to say and makes me think it's a game not worth thinking about and that's like exemplified by every murder in this game just being this over-the-top gore fest with no Mm -hmm. broader like thing to say about the actual game i'm playing which uh makes it look juvenile and stupid compared to manhunt which i'm not going to call high art but at least was attempting to swing at some yeah. semblance of an idea in, in the previous episode we talked about how how manhunt one had these incredibly over-the-top headshot animations yeah. that they would only show up with like the later shotguns or the rifles which were like more than halfway through the game and so when you got to those it kind of it suddenly felt that you were capable of a level of violence that you weren't allowed earlier. In this, every single pistol headshot from the very first one will just blow their little head off and leave a stump there. And because the aiming system now lines up headshots for you almost immediately, you will see it 20 times per level. You just, it's just like every single kill is someone's head being blown off in a way that reduces it to nothing where I don't feel like it's it's like kind of shocking anymore it's just the thing that happens when I click on someone's head this game also introduces um environmental kills which mm-hmm. on the one hand are kind of cool I just like that idea you kind of see them on oh, your I, mini map. I do actually like those yeah, yeah you see them on your mini map but they also like depending on the one that they intro- what's the main character of this game called what's his name Danny how could I forget Danny? <laughs> uh, they also, in some instances, turn him into a superhuman, which is dumb. Like, you can pick up um, sewer grates, lids, whatever those yeah, things are Yeah, like called. a manhole cover. Yeah, yeah a, a manhunt cover, if you will. Um, and bash <laughs> people over the head with them. And I'm like, all right. What's going on in this game, Jacob? Yeah, I... I, I, I don't... It, you know, it's just... It's like, it is, like we said, it's easier to play. But, but the... As we talked about so much, the the idea of being hunted Mm -hmm. in Manhunt, being weaker than the enemies, it's like, there is no, it's so easy to win a fist fight in this game. Yeah. Like, it's, it's like, it's just, you're just going to win any one-on-one, which was certainly not the case. There are things, there are things that I like. Uh, I I don't, I don't want to, I don't want it to just be a hate parade. I think... Some of the locations you go to are at least interesting. Uh, you know, there's there's a level in like 
there are a couple levels in like clubs uh, and something that I love in any video game level, and there there are a couple of these in Hitman, which are always so good, is just an unbelievably loud club floor. Yep. Uh, you know, where there's just, like, music blaring, and because it's loud, you can do loud things mm-hmm. and no one hears you, uh, which is pretty interesting. There's a very good bit where you're in, like, an S&M dungeon, and there is a mirror, and you see yourself in the mirror, and then it breaks, and someone's like, ah, fuck you, behind yeah, it, and they, you know, run out. That's a good bit. Um, I like the environmental kills. The S&M dungeon, which I think is level... It's very early. It's like level two or three. I I like that mm-hmm. level. I think it's cool. I think it's a cool setting. Um, it feels very old school rock star, where it's like, this is a dumb idea of what <laughs> bondage in S&M really is, but I'm right. having fun, and it's stupid little world. You have you have the classic uh like you know stripper from a PS2 game where she has <laughs> yeah. exactly one animation that she yeah. just does over and over and over. There's also a scene in this level where they show a shot of um a dance floor and there's a bunch of women dancing, but they're all the exact same character model doing the exact same dance, and I'm like, ah, I miss old games, man. Back when games were art. <laughs> back back when games were art. Um, there was something in ma- this level or the next one that did make me very mad, and it, it it goes back to our conversation about, like, ratings and whatever, of, like, at some point towards the end of a level, you step out from behind a stage in front of a movie screen, and the movie is playing porn. Right. Do you remember this? Yes. Which is actually kind of... I like the idea of stepping out from behind the stage onto a stage. You know, like, I think that's that's just, like, a fun thing. But they do this, like, they really make sure, you know, they show they show the movie for a while, like, haha, get it? This is porn. You're watching porn. And they're, like, sex noises and whatever. But everyone in the, in the movie is fully clothed like you don't it's not (laughs) actual nudity and it's so it's just this stupid thing of like i have been fucking knocking guys heads off and this is supposedly the most inappropriate game ever made and yet you're watching this like fictionalized version of porn where everyone has sex with their clothes on and like i'm not I'm not saying that I wish the game showed me porn, but I do feel like it just drives home this idea of, like, they're trying to make this this mature, subversive game, and yet, even within mm-hmm. that, they can't be as subversive as just, like, any R movie, you know, because games can't show yeah. boobs in them, or they can't show, you know, people having sex or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think Rockstar had a game of nudity till GTA V, surprisingly enough. Not a fun that, that's fact? such a fun fact. <laughs> changing changing thirteen year olds YouTube searches forever. GTA five dance. Look, as a look, I'm a I'm a historian. You know, it's important that I know these details. Um I think in the previous in Manhunt, we talked about James Earl Cash as a character, or kind of a lack of character, how how he really he rarely talked, you didn't know much about him, you just knew that he killed. Um Danny is uh, strange because he has many more lines, and in many ways he seems like he has a character. Uh, but in many right. other ways, his actions completely contradict whatever character they're trying to build for him. And so he kind of seems mm-hmm. nervous, nebbish, a little, a little like he doesn't want to be doing this. Which then makes the animations where you stab someone with a syringe 17 times feel completely ridiculous because yeah. why would he? Why would his character do this? Like, why would he be so over the top? Yeah, and there's no implication that that's Leo taking over because, you know, they're obviously one in different parts of his brain because Leo is the one directing him. But, like, even Leo is not, like do it this grizzly leo's just like hey kill this fucker you know so it's like a weird disconnect yeah you know leo sometimes like oh you really they can't mess with you danny but it's just like you know why who you could call the story more ambitious in that there are more cut scenes there's more dialogue there's there's more named characters i guess um 
but it's it's just so much more stereotypical you know like i just i i don't i don't feel like they're doing anything new here and in fact by giving the people characters they're kind of taking away some of the intrigue of the original manhunt which was this kind of like blank slate that had great violence kind of put upon him yeah it feels like honestly a cop-out of a story like it literally feels like they people were like fight club was kind of good what if we kind of did that but instead of fighting it was decapitation and it's like that's dumb don't do that yeah you know and so so i guess we have here's some of the background that we do have on danny uh he he went he had an an experimental procedure done to him uh Mm -hmm. that do you get this flashback of him talking to his family where he says hey if we do this we'll never have to worry about money again and it's it's hard to tell from this point whether he was already experiencing multiple personalities and this was theoretically going to fix him or if this procedure was in fact what brought out you know leo from his head you know if if this kind of created the yeah. other personality i'm kind of inclined to think that he was always struggling with this game's version of schizophrenia or something and and the you know, he signed up for an experimental procedure that didn't necessarily work. It is interesting, though. Um, a lot of the game is Danny trying to, like, you know, kind of, um, I don't know, is it like memento style? Like, he's leaving himself clues for him to be able to piece together what he needs to do. And in that process, he runs into, like, a lot of his old colleagues because he worked at this asylum where they were doing whatever tests they were doing. Um, and numerous times when he run in, runs into an old colleague, they recognize that Leo is there in the sense that it's a part of Danny. Yeah. And they are always terrified right. that the part of Danny's brain that is Leo is present in that moment, which I actually like narratively. I think that's yeah, well, I mean, in, in the same way that, uh, you know, when, when Ed Norton walks into a room and starts referring to himself as Tyler, I'm sure everyone was like, oh, yeah, shit's about to go down. You know, like it's okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. We've seen it before, but it it works. There's a part where one of the doctors you confront, she's like talking to someone. That she's like, and uh, by the way, Leo's here. Yeah. I'm fucked. <laughs> like it's over. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, all right, that's um, kind of cool. Yeah. So you you have what I what I do think is, you know, maybe. Uh, where I began to have a little doubt in my reading that they were the same person is just that you have a couple levels where you play as Leo specifically. Um, They're also probably the worst levels Mm -hmm. uh, because they're just, they're just gun levels like there were in the original Manhunt. Um, But, you know, it's like Danny's not there or Danny's asleep and Leo's taken over, you know, whatever the hell the the situation is. Um, But it, it it's just you know it's it's like i feel like i know even though i i can't really predict how this story ends i don't think it's going to surprise no, me no you know um which makes it such a hard game to talk about <laughs> you know i remember hitting this wall with kane and lynch one where after a point it's like yeah, if that's it's that just is kind of its worst crime. You know, like if mm-hmm. Jack Thompson was suing Rockstar being like you made a game that's fucking boring. I would be like that's right, yeah. Jack Thompson. <laughs> you <laughs> you get him. I will say the the uh, something we maybe should have mentioned earlier is we are playing a version on PC um basically uncut. Like we we're play we're seeing all the gory kills as far as I can understand whatever content was still shipped with the game has been unlocked in the version we're playing. Um, And even then looking at all these, you know, kill animations that were so scary that it led to all this bullshit can't make the game interesting for me. Like even seeing it at, at its worst and grisliest, it's like, okay, here it is. Yeah. And I, I think actually that, you know, cause I watched some footage of the, the censored versions of the games. And I think those are more interesting just in that you can paint a pretty direct line from there to Max Payne three with those filters, because yeah. like Max Payne three, even though it is not 
it is not shying away from showing violence, is constantly flashing these red and green and, like, right. like static and obscuring filters all over everything. And it's done in a very similar way to how they covered up the kills here. And so I do think just as, like, a rock star legacy thing, that's, that's fairly interesting. But... Sure. The difference is that Max Payne 3 has a purpose behind doing that, and in this, the purpose is to have the game rated M instead of AO. Do you think we should do the last episode of this season, just play some Max Payne 3, talk about that game again? That was a good game. Yeah, that's it. We don't we don't have to finish this. <laughs> no, I want to finish this game, especially because it will probably take me two hours, uh, because this yeah. game is so short. Uh, I want to go back and and just cover, now that we've talked about the game, let's talk about some more drama, which is, again, the, the more interesting thing here. Um the U.S. had a uh, campaign for a commercial-free childhood, which, honestly, uh, I would like a commercial-free childhood. Sounds good. Commercial-free um, childhood. Except it turns out that they're one of these just kind of, like, child protection censorship yeah. things. Um, uh, who who had a doctor quoted saying that um, the Wii control was going to give physicality that was going to make it, uh, you know, so close to reality that it was absolutely dangerous to release the children. Um, I, I do... <laughs> There's another Jack Thompson story here that is just so funny. This is, again, you know, the, the notorious attorney who... who sued to get various video games taken off jack jack thompson said that uh he was going to uh have manhunt 2 and gta 4 both of them uh banned as public nuisances uh that was his tactic uh, uh, uh. and and take two said that these could not be banned as public nuisances because they're purchased for private entertainment um Jack Thompson said in a real just like like you know mega mind ultra brain response said uh, I have been praying literally that take two and its lawyers would do something so stupid that such a misstep would enable me enable me to destroy take two the pit take two has dug for itself will be patently clear next week when I strike back and he also said that Rockstar North were quote Scottish sociopaths sipping their single malt Glenlivet in between brainstorming software programming sessions. Uh, and look, I, I hate to take Jack Thompson's side on this, but that's easily <laughs> the funniest thing said in human history. That, that is, is so, hilarious. It's so good. Um, <laughs> uh, and here's the thing. Jack Thompson, in fact, did not destroy Take-Two at all, and he settled <laughs> Believe to it or not. drop all charges. Um uh, and and he's able to drop all charges and not pursue any further lawsuits. Uh, but he didn't. Uh, and after he agreed to not pursue any further lawsuits, um, he wrote to uh, the Wendy's CEO, Carrie Anderson, and demanded that uh, Wendy's had toy tie-ins for Excite Truck, Wii Sports, and Super Mario Galaxy. And he said that they needed to drop all those because those were appearing on the same console platform as Manhunt 2. And as such, mm -hmm. Excite Truck, Wii Sports, and Super Mario Galaxy were also now threats to society. Uh, Wendy's did not respond because why would they? Jack Thompson goes so hard, dude. What a legend. American I badass just love, for sure. I love the idea of like... Like, you can't sell a DVD because you can also get a DVD of porn that will work on the same machine. <laughs> That's true. Uh, wait till Jack Thompson learns about computers. Oh, my God. That rules. Yeah. I love that. I mean, I don't. It's actually troubling for society that we allow people like that such platforms. But also, it's a bit funny to talk about what they say. To our credit as a society, uh, he really didn't do shit. You know, the <laughs> game true. came out. And I'm sure he's still getting plenty of speaking paychecks from places like Fox News to this day. Who knows? I wonder. I wonder what he's up to. Uh, Blake, you want to talk about the reception of this game a little bit? Yeah, I, I, I looked up reviews. There were a lot of interesting reviews that came out about Manhunt 1. So I assumed with all the hullabaloo around Manhunt 2, there would also be equally interesting reviews. One, you know, it, there weren't. The game wasn't good, and no one really wanted to give it the time of day other than the outlets that had to. So I only found one good quote, which I actually just pulled from Wikipedia, but it was still just the best quote in the review, which was from 
One up Scott Sharkey. One up, of course, one of the best video game sites to ever do it. Rest in peace. Uh, who said, really, the game warrants a four? I don't understand what that's an allusion to because their rating system was like A, B, C, and D. Maybe it was an old rating. Anyway, <laughs> uh, because it's technically playable and despite its best efforts, probably won't plunge the industry into a period of naval, naval gazing and political sanction. Everything else about it is largely forgettable. And you know what, Scott? I think you hit the nail on the head. The game, it came out like a wet thud. Um, there are a few positive reviews, like GameSpot was kind of into it. And uh, Game Informer, my alma mater, uh, they didn't seem very into it, but also gave it like a 7.75. You know, you know how those things go. You know, a Game uh, Informer, 4 out of 10. <laughs> Look, you know, I plead the fifth. Um uh, <laughs> But the reviews, it's very funny for everything that went on with this game. It did come out, and the people who uh, perhaps were jaded to all the controversy, and rightfully so at this period, were just not willing to engage with a game that wasn't worth thinking twice about, which I feel like you read in a lot of these reviews where it's just like, yeah, it's just kind of a boring game. Yeah, I mean, it it, it does reflect some things you know we we make allusions to the game hatred all the time but mm. it's like it's similar to that where it's like oh there's all this hullabaloo before it comes out and then when it does come out people realize like it's just not worth it you know like it's not it's not yeah interesting enough to be a point of societal conflict and and mm-hmm. there were so many you know quotes about manhunt one arguing not just for it as a game but like for this this role of the type of media in society, you know, where they were saying, mm-hmm. like, like it's important that we allow shit like this. And even though Manhunt 2, arguably more violent, maybe more transgressive, just no one's willing to go to bat because, like, what does it get you? You know, at the end of the day, you mm-hmm. get to play Manhunt 2, and that sucks. So <laughs> Yeah, and that's do? not a good thing in your life, as I'm learning currently. Um, So... Uh, with that, next week we'll be playing the second half of Manhunt 2. Yeah, uh, this week for us, we got to beat this game in two days. Yeah, <laughs> which, which is yeah, I, I, it's probably very doable because, again, the game sure. is incredibly short. Um, is that it? Do you have anything else to add, Blake? No, um, I'm ready to move on <laughs> with my life <laughs> for right. Manhunt 2. Which, well, you know what, is is like, it's it's a bummer because I think if you would have asked me three weeks ago, what are you most excited for in the season? I'd be like, Manhunt 2, for sure. Do you remember all the shit about that game? I can't wait to play it. And then coming off Manhunt 1, when I, where I felt like I was pretty hot on the game, you're like, all right, they're going to be they're gonna be expanding on some ideas here with Manhunt 2. And it just feels like no one that... I shouldn't say that. It feels like people were not maybe willing to engage further with their own source material when working on the sequel Mm -hmm. and just abandoned a lot of good and interesting concepts and ideas, which sucks. Yeah. But that being said, I, I genuinely am curious about how this game ends. I do want to know what they're going to do. If they will differentiate themselves from fight club, uh, you know, like what, (laughs) what's going to happen to old Danny and Leo. Um, yeah, Uh, Yeah, so until next time, uh, I'm Jacob. For Blake, uh, this has been Something Rotten. Stay tuned. Bye.